So good morning, everybody um, in Australia and New Zealand. My name's Leanne Lim, and I'm here with Dr. Peter Haddon, and we're starting off the ophthalmology live session this morning. Um, so a couple of housekeeping things. Um, if you do have questions, we're going to keep them till the end of the session, um, but you can put them up through the chat as we go, and then we'll scroll back through them and come back to them all at the end. Um, so I'll hand over to Dr. Haddon now. So, good morning. Uh, my name's Peter Haddon. I run the uh, ocular oncology service for adults uh, in New Zealand. So I'm going to tell you what happens uh, in our part of the world, um, which is probably very much like in uh, most other places as well. Um, so we're based in Auckland, although actually I'm coming to you from Christchurch from my daughter's house. So you get uh, found with a tumour either because you've got symptoms and you go and see your optometrist or your GP perhaps, or because you're on a monitoring program such as that for diabetes, or having a regular eye examination without symptoms and your tumour gets spotted. Then what happens is you'll be referred to your local ophthalmologist in your nearest town and city. Um, and that, if that ophthalmologist thinks you've got something sinister or they want it looked at, then they'll liaise with me and send you up to Auckland. When you come to my clinic, uh, you'll first meet a nurse and they ask you some standard questions. And this is the pro forma we fill in. Uh, we've just uh, plagiarized it straight from Liverpool in the UK, which is where I did my training. So they ask you these standard questions to get a bit of an idea if you've got symptoms, how long it's taken for you to get to our service, and a bit about your past medical history, if you're feeling unwell, if you've had tumors before. And then they'll also uh, test your vision on the eye chart and eye pressure. Next, you see our photographer. They'll take a photo of your eye and the tumor and also some scans. Um, and you can see a photo and a scan there. And then you'll see myself. So I'll run over the history, um, check what they've written, ask any questions relevant to it. And then I'll have a look at your eye. I'll also do it. Another sort of scan, an ultrasound scan, or we call it a B scan, and here you can see I'm doing a B scan on a patient, and hopefully be able to give you some sort of explanation and, and possible diagnosis. Uh, if I uh, think you need some sort of treatment, then I'll run over a consent form with you, and I'll try and answer these sort of questions as to the uh, what the tumour is, what the chances you're going to lose your eye or even die from the tumour, um, and also the various side effects of both the tumour and the treatment, because of course all treatments have side effects too. Then, of course, hopefully uh, you just go home and uh, stay home because I've said your tumour's benign, but if it's melanoma, which is the most common primary ocular malignancy um, in adults, then we might have to bring you back to Auckland for a plaque. Sometimes, unfortunately, you'll have to have your eye removed, uh, and that's usually done wherever you're from. So if you're from, you know, um, uh, Hamilton, you'll have it done in Hamilton. There's another treatment, the radiation, radiation treatment that um, you'd have to go to Dunedin for, stereotactic radiotherapy. And there's uh, a few other things we sometimes do. Um, Occasionally, you may have to go to Christchurch for PDT. Um, so you uh, may end up traveling around the country sometimes and a little bit back and forth, and it all takes a while to organize. So basically, you come up, see me in clinic, then go home while we organize these things, and then usually go to where you have to go to for your treatment. It's a similar kind of system in Australia. There are similar clinics in the largest cities in Australia. And therapy in Melbourne and Sydney and looking at the rain outside here in Christchurch I wish I was in Australia maybe right now 
what sort of interventions uh, do we do? Well, sometimes we might biopsy it and send a little specimen away to the lab. This doesn't often help us telling whether it's a mole or a melanoma that you've got, but it can tell how aggressive the tumour is, and Leanne's going to talk more about that. In uh, uh, Auckland, we use uh, radioactive plaques. You use something called ruthenium. Uh, this is also widely used in the Australian centres. Some Australian centres also use another isotope, another radioactive material called iodine. So uh, if you need a plaque put on, we uh, give you a general anaesthetic, and you can see here a plaque being inserted uh, over the outside of the eye. We sew it on there, and then uh, and, and we have uh, quite strict protocols as to uh, what we do, as you can see. And then you're taken back to the ward and you're put in a little room like this with an ensuite. It's a nice room. It's got a view. Um, and you stay there for a few days while the radiation uh, takes effect and uh, delivers the proper dose to the tumour. I know that in some places uh, they allow you to go to a motel or hotel, uh, but in, in Auckland uh, we just uh, ask you to stay in this room. And then we take it off. Uh, again, we've got a very uh, strict protocol as to what we do, as you can see here. And the tumour, that the radiation um, is designed to uh, alter the DNA, the makeup of the cells of the tumour so that when the cell tries to divide, it dies. So it doesn't make the tumour just go away like that. It rather slowly shrinks as the, each cell is trying to divide over months and years. And the faster growing tumours, the worst tumours probably, shrink more rapidly. Unfortunately, you've also got cells in the rest of your retina that are dividing as well. And the one that has far, divides the most quickly is the endothelial cell that uh, lines the blood vessels and therefore uh, the vasculature of your eye is affected first and you can see how really it does kill the retina you can see this bit here where there's been a plaque underneath here and the retina there is really all gone while over here there's some healthy retina question people ask is uh, what is ruthenium well it's just a metal in the platinum series in it. There's a uh, little piece of ruthenium. Uh, it's radioactive metal and it emits electrons, which is called beta radiation. It doesn't penetrate very far, so you can only use it for tumours up to maybe about seven millimetres thick. That, that can vary depending, but roughly that sort of size. You can see that the amount of radiation that's given off decays very quickly over a very short period, uh, a very short um, distance. Um, so while you're in that little room by yourself, uh, you don't have to remain by yourself. Other people can come and visit you. Uh, we usually allow people to come for an hour at a time. If you sit inside for a day, just anywhere in, uh, in the world, you'll probably get the same radiation just for the ground, from the ground as if you sit one meter from someone wearing a plaque in them uh, for an hour. And if you go on a plane ride, you'll get way more radiation. Um, uh, all of us uh, who put these plaques on, wear little badges which count how much radiation we get. And I have uh, little ones on my fingers as well. And I've only once got a reading greater than just background radiation. So it's pretty safe, um, the people around you but we still just limit the time you have with other people. Another common treatment that we use is stereotactic radiotherapy. This is where you get uh, radiation from all around you and it all um, is concentrated into a little ball, a minimum size about seven millimeters, which you can put anywhere you like with about one millimeter of accuracy. For New Zealanders, this involves a trip to Dunedin, uh, it's also done in Melbourne and Sydney in Australia. Uh, they'll put you in this, a frame like this. This isn't bolted to your head or anything. It's just around your head. 
and you can see the person's biting down on it just to keep things steady. And we use a scanner to localize uh, the tumor in this frame so we can see exactly where it is. And here is the uh, machine that delivers the stereotactic radiotherapy in Dunedin. Uh, you are there for a week, and basically you get go into the hospital every day that week for five days in a row and get um, a fraction of a dose at each visit. So, uh, And then afterwards you just go back home. It doesn't touch you at all. Um, there's no surgery involved, and you don't have to do anything special afterwards. You're not radioactive or anything. People often worry that they're going to move their eye, uh, but we monitor you with this little camera and you can see the TV, and people never move their eye more than about five millimeter, uh, uh, 0.5 millimetres or so. People keep their eye very still. Very occasionally, uh, from both Australia and New Zealand, uh, people will be sent over to Liverpool in the UK for a treatment called proton beam radiotherapy, and the governments will pay for it. When it's really indicated for a few things, it, it is a, a, probably a better treatment in a few patients. Uh, uh, even in pre-coronavirus uh, days, of course, it was a long way to go. Um, in New Zealand uh, did fly to London, but it had to stop for refueling in Los Angeles. And this is a person undergoing proton beam radiotherapy. Very similar to stereotactic radiotherapy, you're in a gantry like this, and the beam is fired at you. Um, for most tumors at the back here, you have to have an operation beforehand to put some markers on so that they know exactly where to fire the beam. But sometimes you don't have to have that done. Um, they are building a proton beam facility in Adelaide, which uh, will obviously be great. Although whether or not it'll be able to treat eye tumors, we're not quite sure at this stage. It's still um, early days. Sometimes we might uh, chop your tumor out. This is a bit controversial, and people worry about the tumor potentially being able to seed around your eyes when you're chopping it out. There are two ways of doing it. You can remove the, a part of the white wall of the eye and take it out from the outside or you can go from the inside. And here's a patient who's had their tumor there removed surgically. So there's another treatment too called transpupillary thermotherapy. It's a type of laser which heats up the melanoma. And uh, it came in just over 20 years ago. People were very excited about this because it didn't have the same issues as radiation uh, to the rest of the eye. But we found that it uh, it didn't do as well. The tumor uh, recurred more commonly. Sometimes you might use uh, TTT as well. Uh, as, as a plaque though, um, that can help. Just treat the uh, thick tumors a bit better or tumors that are leaking fluid, uh, like this one was, reduce their leakage. Uh, Willie Campbell, uh, one of our Melbourne colleagues, he came up with the idea of using another laser photodynamic therapy uh, for non-pigmented melanomas. Um, and so occasionally that's done as well. That's not all though. After you've had the primary treatment, uh, you've still got to have follow-up. Usually this will be done in your local hospital um, and you wait and see uh, that the tumor shrinks and stops growing. And here you can see the remnants of a tumor years later, which has had a plaque put on it. You can see that white area where the radiation has affected the retina around the tumor. But that, that tumor is well treated. Of course, um, the thing you really worry about is are you gonna get metastases or, or liver cancer from the tumor? And the problem is uh, the tumor can send little seeds to your liver that just stay quiet and dormant that no scan ever picks up until they start growing. And that can be years and years later. So we usually suggest six monthly ultrasounds of your liver, which is a very easy, quick, simple test to do, to see if any 
thing is starting to show up in your liver. Sometimes people will see oncologists and they'll recommend other more detailed types of scans such as MRIs and PET scans. Um, the problem is though, if you find it in the liver, it's the, a cure for that is very far away. Very occasionally, you might be able to successfully resect uh, a uh, tumour from the liver, but um, we uh, are a long way from uh, really curing liver cancer, although there are some exciting developments on the horizon which you may have heard about. So, thank you. Uh, we'll leave questions maybe till Leanne's done her talk as well. Okay, thanks, Peter. So, I'll follow on now. So is that sharing, Peter? Yes? Okay. Uh, so my name's Leanne. I'm an ocular oncologist in Sydney. Um, and uh, thank you for having me this year. I'm just going to talk a little bit about ocular melanoma patient care in 2020 in Australia and New Zealand and where we are now. Um, so just mainly looking at detection and then also a little bit about genetics and multidisciplinary care. So detection, when we talk about cancer, we all know that the message is early detection is the key. But it can be very different, uh, difficult to tell things apart. So often optometrists or ophthalmologists may see any of these presentations. And the difficulty is, well, which one is an ocular melanoma? and who should be seen and by whom and, and where should they be seen. So a picture is worth a thousand words. So I can tell you that the sunset, sunset was breathtaking um, or I can show you a picture. And for those of you who are Game of Thrones fans, the words winter is coming gives you a, an idea of what's to come or this picture also instills certain things that you want to share about that message. So often you, we might get an, a referral that says, thank you for seeing this gentleman with a choroidal lesion. And that may be referring to a lesion like this or indeed a lesion like this. Um, so a picture is worth a thousand words. And as you all know, fundus photography or pictures at the back of the eye are so useful. And um, they really are helping us to triage and um, make sure that people are seen in a timely fashion and by the right person. So um, on one end, you know, smaller lesions that can, perhaps can be monitored by an optometrist or larger or more suspicious lesions that should be managed by an ocular oncologist, um, especially in this time of COVID and, um, you know, telemedicine um, has really become something that we're using a lot more of and so pictures are so helpful. Um, and we can also share care with more local providers, especially for our regional patients, which we see a lot of, especially in a vast country like Australia and also I'm sure in New Zealand. And lastly, um, in addition to colour photography, as a lot of you would know, we now have other ways of imaging lesions. Um, so multimodal imaging um, can also help us to detect which lesions are more risky. And so a lot of you would have had these tests. So in picture A, they're a colour fundus photograph, but in B, an autofluorescence, which helps us to have a look for this orange pigment or protein called lipofuscin, um, and C, which is an OCT. Um, and together, using the clinical features and now these multimodal imaging, um, we can better characterise um, spots in the back of the eye, but, but also lesions at the front of the eye. Um, and so you would all um, have heard about risk factors that we use to evaluate different um, lesions or things that we think might be moles or melanomas. And we now know that um, certain risk factors are maybe perhaps more risky. And often when people have symptoms of vision loss or orange pigment, um, they seem to be have a higher risk of progression. So a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, we need to encourage people to get dilated, to take fundus photographs, 
Um, the other thing is that often we will look back on people's photographs um, and someone will say, oh, no one ever mentioned a mole in the back of my eye or it was normal. And when we look back, there perhaps was that spot there the whole time. Um, so it allows us for timely triage, telemedicine and also um, multimodal imaging so we can better identify high-risk lesions. So moving on to genetics and multidisciplinary care. Um, genetics in ocular melanoma, well, what does that all really mean? So are we talking about your genetic profile or are we talking about your tumour's genetic profile? So BAP1 tumour predisposition syndrome, that stands for breast cancer associated protein 1. Um, and this is a relatively new cancer syndrome um, that was discovered in 2012. It's hereditary, meaning that it is inherited through families. Um, and is autosomal dominant, meaning that it passes down from each generation to the next generation. Um, and it's a mutation in this gene called BAP1, um, which is in all of your cells. And it leads to this increased risk of developing a group of certain rare cancers. Um, so if you do have this syndrome, um, then uveal melanoma or melanoma in the back of the eye is actually the most common cancer that people who have this syndrome tend to develop. Um, and then the next one is mesothelioma and then in decreasing order of frequency down that list in the blue there, um, other tumours that have been found in this group include renal or kidney cancer and skin cancers like basal cell carcinoma or, or atypical spitz tumours. Um, and then there's this group in the yellow column um, to the right um, and there are other cancers that have also been described in this syndrome but are yet to be confirmed as part of it. And so when should we think about whether um, a patient has BAP1 tumor predisposition syndrome? Well, if they have two of the cancers in, in the list um, on the left there, then we would suspect that. Um, if you have one and maybe a first degree relative um, who also has one of these cancers or a family history of uveal melanoma, or you were diagnosed at a very young age, or if you have multifocal um, disease, um, then we might talk to you about this and discuss testing. Um, so, sorry. Um, and so that is a, a blood test. Um, and we would often refer you to a genetic um, counselor or geneticist to discuss whether you should have that testing. And so that is a situation where you may have an eye melanoma because of your genetic profile. And we may send you for testing for BAP1 testing. So what about your tumor's genetic profile? So for conjunctival melanoma and eyelid melanoma, as a lot of you would know, um, mostly people have treatment which is largely um, excision and we take out your tumour and send it away to pathology. And so that way we may also send it away for a genetic profile assessment to look at the genetics of your tumour. And what does this information actually tell us? So at this stage in 2020, um, genetic information about tumours from conjunctival or eyelid melanomas may tell us if you could be a candidate or if you would be a patient who could have some kind of targeted therapy or immunotherapy. And this is useful especially for people who have multifocal diffuse disease um, or if you have um, advanced disease that keeps on coming back and we want to try and avoid extensive surgery such as exenteration where we have to remove the whole eye and all of the tissue around it. Or if the disease has spread um, and other forms of chemotherapy um, are not so effective. And at this stage, um, the genetic information as a prognostic um, marker um, is not so well understood at this stage. And so there are maybe only early studies that are suggesting that that may be a good use for the genetic information. So if we move on to choroidal melanoma and iris melanoma, well, genetic information for these melanoma tumours of the eye actually do give us quite a lot of prognostic information. Um, and it has a very unique um, genetic profile in that we can describe the genetics of these tumours in many different ways, as you can see on this list here, from looking at the number of chromosomes um, to dividing into different classes, so class one and class two, 
or more recently looking at all of the genetics and it's been divided into um, groups from A to D. And basically it separates the tumours out into groups of tumours that perhaps have a better prognosis in terms of developing disease spread or a less favourable um, risk of developing disease spread. But the thing with choroidal melanomas and iris melanomas is that we don't always treat them um, by taking out the tumour. And so to get the genetic material, we do actually need to get some tissue. So that may be by a nucleation. It may be by a needle biopsy or indeed a vitrectomy, which is an operation to go into the eye. And so considerations surrounding this include the risks of a procedure, um, the chance that sometimes in very small tumours this can be difficult to actually get enough tissue to give you an answer. Or sometimes we do know that, you know, that there can be more than one genetic clone or the tumours are sometimes not the same all the way through. So depending on where you take your sample from, you may get, um, you know, different information. And how else can we prognosticate? Well, a lot of you would have heard about the AJCC classification, and this is a tumour classification that we use for a lot of solid other solid tumours. Um, and so in uveal melanoma especially, um, you would see that as our oncologists all have a look at the thickness and the basal diameter, um, which can also help us to, um, to get this information. So in whatever way that you do, that we are able to get the prognostic information, either by a biopsy or using um, the AJCC classification, we are able to, to come up together with an, uh, the medical oncologist, a metastatic surveillance regimen for you, which brings me to multidisciplinary care. Um, and the fact that a lot of you would have received care from ocular oncologists, but also from our ocular pathologists, our radiation oncologists, and our medical oncologists. And we all, even though you see us all at separate times, we all do work together um, to provide you with integrated holistic patient care. Um, and in Sydney, we also do run multidisciplinary care meetings where we just discuss all of our patients with all of these people um, so that we can uh, provide the best care that we can. So just to summarise, in 2020, I talked a little bit about detection and how multimodal imaging and telehealth has helped us a lot and is helping us to detect lesions earlier. And then a little bit about the genetics and multidisciplinary care, which is helping us to find new treatment options for people and also um, prognostication for metastatic surveillance. So thank you very much for your time. Happy to take questions. So I'll stop sharing. Um, so I might get Peter, you to come on board now and we'll have a look through our questions. Um, maybe. Um, people can write uh, questions in the chat and we're very happy to answer them. I think I can see one question in our Q&A from Dr Ian Kammerman, um, but perhaps Claire might be better to answer it. So he's asked, about patients in Australia and New Zealand, if they're sent for proton beam, what makes this a better option? Um, well, uh, from New Zealand, we might send patients for proton beam, sometimes for certain iris melanomas, which are um, they, they're treated very well with proton beam. You don't have to put the markers on, and it probably has less uh, side effects and some other treatments. We also might uh, send them sometimes for, if they've got a tumour surrounding the optic nerve, the nerve at the back of your eye, as uh, it, it can, proton beams got uh, very tight margins, so you can be very accurate in where you uh, put the radiation. And if it's around a structure like the optic nerve, which is a very um, important part of your eye, it takes uh, messages from your eye to your brain, uh, if you can try and reduce the radiation to dose to that, then you might uh, get slightly better vision 
than if you use one of our treatments. We probably do tend to reserve it for younger patients and uh, patients with, you know, otherwise good prognosis or maybe people with uh, an only eye. It's not that much better than other treatments, but there are some people who might particularly benefit from it. And it is covered by, I know um, they send a, uh, several from Victoria particularly, but I, I presume also from Sydney and other parts of Australia as well. Yeah, I agree with all of those things. Uh, Catherine's asked a similar question. Uh, yeah, I mean, around near the optic nerve, you've either got to use something like proton beam or, or stereotactic radiotherapy will treat it around the optic nerve. Some parts of Australia, I believe, have notched plaques, which you could put around it. We don't have that, so we would just send you to Dunedin for stereotactic or if you're a really good candidate to the UK for proton beam. And uh, near the fovea, um, well, you know, you treat anything close to the fovea with radiation and it's, it's not that good for your vision. But the aim here is to treat the tumour, not the, you know, uh, if it affects your sight, well, it has kind of got to, you've got to get rid of the tumour. Yeah, so in Sydney, we, uh, I think we do have notched plaques, but we also have stereotactic radiotherapy, so we tend to send our patients um, for that. Um, and I think in the past, sometimes if we have plaques, we um, have also used some TTT as a little bit of extra um, to prevent recurrence. Um, so I see a question from Lauren. What are some of the side effects people can expect after radiation and are those noticeable right away or will those come up years later? I think you mentioned some of those, Peter, in your talk. Uh, well, with plaque, I always mention that initially you could get double vision because you often have to move muscles out of the way. So you can get double vision straight away after a plaque and that can be very disabling because you can't drive if you've got double vision. It often improves by itself or it's minimal. It's only if you look maybe to one side, but sometimes it can be bad. And and, uh, and then really it's later on down the track of the other complications. There are a couple of years later that you start to lose vision from the radiation-induced changes. Sometimes you can help them. You can give these injections, sometimes help um, certain uh, complications if there's leakage uh, from the tumour. But... It depend, basically the real thing is where the tumour is determines what the complications are going to be. Yeah, I agree. And, um, yeah, I often say after plaque treatment, yeah, double vision is something that can happen straight away, but often very commonly your eyes are a little bit red and sore and watery, um, and that usually is quite transient, gets better over the next month or so. Um, and then radiation... Um, Side effects can be things like dry eye that can be treated with lubricants or um, and cataract, which can be also treated with treatment. But then, as Peter was saying in his talk, it tends to affect the blood vessels and the other cells in your eye that slowly replicate. So that happens usually months or years down the track and the vision can tend to slowly drift down the chart. So you'll see less and less letters down the chart. Um, some things that can affect your vision suddenly like swelling in the back of the eye sometimes can be treated a little bit with injections or other treatments to try and improve the vision um but peter would you say yeah it's usually a slow drifting down the chart people don't often go to no light perception quickly with i mean the best thing to do is have a small tumor somewhere anterior in the retina away from somewhere anywhere really important and then you then you can be fine. Yeah, so it can be very variable depending on where your tumour is and how big it is. Okay. Um, so I think we still have a little bit more time if anyone does have any other questions. Oh, um. uh, what type of low vision assistance? So, well, uh, low vision assistance may vary depending where you are. 
uh, and obviously people often have uh, two eyes. So, uh, you know, if you've got one good eye, you can do virtually everything. Uh, but if uh, you're starting to lose the vision in overall, then low vision support. So there are low vision clinics, um, which are all around New Zealand and I'm sure around Australia, um, where they'll look at things like um, magnifying glasses or CCTV to help people see or, or at least function. And uh, you can join the, the Royal New Zealand Foundation for the Blind, even if you're not blind, uh, but if you're partially sighted and they'll help you. Unfortunately, you know, if your vision does drop to a certain level, you're going to lose the ability to drive um, and things. So you can't uh, do everything. Yeah, and I, I think um, so uh, just coming off the back of that. So for um, patients who do undergo an enucleation, we um, will still see them. Well, we see them yearly, but it's important to keep up that relationship with your ophthalmologist. So we always check the, the other eye and dilate it every time um, and protective goggles for your good eye. Um, but yeah, similarly in, in Australia, we have um, some Vision Australia and um, Eye Dogs and many other um, associations that can help you um, with AIDS or indeed come to your house and make sure that you have that and there's a question about why fast shrinking tumors aren't necessarily better. Uh, uh, so that's because really a fast shrinking tumor might be one that is dividing more quickly. And so you, the tumor cells die when they try and divide. So if it's dividing more quickly, it'll uh, die more quickly. Um, so you don't really want to see a tumor shrink too quickly. And the sort of time you're looking at you don't see it change very much for several months, quite a lot of months, and even longer in stereotactic radiotherapy, maybe a couple of years. Uh, and then it slowly, slowly shrinks over the next few years. Um, you can start to see, see some changes after maybe nine months around a plaque, that sort of time period. I agree. Um, I've seen a question here from Jonas. Which test can you do with a needle biopsy? Do you do gene expression analysis, class one or two, about fine nuclear staining or NGS? Um, so the ones that I've sent away, I think we have done, sometimes they will be able to have a look at BAP1 by immunohistochemistry. Um, and I think we do NGS. I'm not sure we haven't sent any away to Castle Biosciences, but mostly just for costs. We've been doing it locally. Um, Peter, what are you guys doing in these? Uh, we used to do a technique called FISH, but there are quite a few limitations in that. So we now use SNPs uh, and um, CGA array. Um, and Anthony's asked, should we be doing more biopsies? I mean, the good thing about a biopsy is uh, it doesn't really help you much in terms of the diagnosis, but you can prognosticate, you can tell people how likely they are to get tumours down the track. And maybe there's this promise of being able to treat people who have got ag aggressive tumours or certain types of tumours uh, if you know their genetics. Um, although there's nothing that really is good at that yet, but there are a few things that are promising. Um, so. There are people who would argue that, well, if you can't do much too, why should you be biopsying? And there are also cases where there has been spread of the tumor outside the eye through biopsy. Um, so uh, it's a little bit, it's debated <laughs> as to what you do. I mean, certainly if a patient has their eye removed, you're gonna uh, send it for cytogenetics. Yeah, so we're sending all of our nucleations to do cytogenetics. Um, I, I guess there's also the um, cost of doing genetics. And are you, in New Zealand, is it covered by Medicare? It, uh, it's funded by the government. <coughs> it is, okay, yep. I think that we managed to get that, but I'm not quite sure of all the arrangements that we have at the minute. Um, and the other thing is, um, well, Peter, you'd be able to say, is very small tumours, so it can be very hard to, to 
to get enough sample. Yeah, if you've got a very tiny tumour, so maybe if it's a large melanoma, it's pretty obvious what it is and you can get a big sample. But if you're saying you're trying to determine whether something really tiny is a melanoma or a nevus, you're only going to get a tiny sample anyway. And the pathologists, you often get a report back saying, well, it could be this, it could be that, but interpret in the light of the clinical findings. That's what I often get. Is that what you get? Yeah, I mean, we haven't done too many for smaller lesions, just for that uh, not Neither have I for yeah. that reason. Yeah, for that reason. But I think, um, like, I mean, we are only doing, like, biopsies really for if there's diagnostic uncertainty. So if you thought it was, um, yeah, you know, maybe not a melanoma, maybe something else, we sometimes do it for that. And then um, we're not doing a lot for just for pure prognostication. So I'm not really sure how many people are doing biopsies with it to decide whether they should treat it or I not. think I Tim in Perth is doing like, quite a bit more from yeah. what at least it sounds like he is. Yeah. 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 So there's kind of diagnostic purposes to do a biopsy, but then also like you know you're sure it's melanoma and then the prognostic purpose. Um and I think, well, yeah, we're uh when I trained in at Will's Eye, we were doing prognostic biopsies rather than diagnostic biopsies. Yeah. So it, it varies yeah. and um, depends on the point. And sometimes I've gone on and off biopsies myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh question I'm in New Zealand had a nucleation done a year ago. Well, unlike Leanne, actually we don't suggest follow up with ophthalmology, um, especially in the public hospital system, uh, this, we, we can't really keep seeing people once a year who, who are down to one eye. We do suggest they say see um, the ocular prosthetician, the person who makes the prosthetic eye once a year, um, and they uh, often can clean it and things. Uh, and I think um, you can see your local optometrist once a year just to keep an eye on the other eye. And I think that's perfectly reasonable. I mean, I don't think you necessarily have to see an ophthalmologist. Um, an ophthalmologist isn't, if you need a change of glasses, the ophthalmologist is going to be useless and that's probably the most common thing you'll need. Yeah, just someone to look at your other eye. Good. Nigel has asked, what is happening here is that we now need tumour details for clinical trials. Yes, that's the that's why people might be doing biopsies if you've got a, access to a clinical trial um, and you uh, need to know the tumour mutations. I'll put out a call for any last questions before we wrap up. What do you I've got two presenters in Sydney, Leanne. Okay, one last question here. Which cancer types can generate metastasis in the eye? Are they easy to distinguish from uveal melanoma? Do you want me? To, I'll give you. Well, I'll give you my answer. And um, the most common ones would be lung, and those people are generally going to be smokers, and they often know they've got had lung cancer before, and breast cancer, which actually often people don't necessarily know they've got uh, they've had breast cancer before, and there are quite a lot of other ones that can really go to the eye. Um, they aren't pigmented. Uh, well, except for cutaneous melanoma, but basically they're going to be white and most melanomas are pigmented, but they're not all pigmented. They do tend to look different. Uh, they're not quite as uh, dome-shaped. Um, they're a bit more um, spread out. Sometimes they can have more fluid, but it's not always uh, completely easy to distinguish between the two or completely say that this couldn't be a melanoma. Um, yeah. yeah, 
So I agree, Bre um, lung and breast, the most common, um, smoking history and um, yeah, tend to be more amelanotic. So for the amelanotic melanomas, sometimes that might be something. And if you get a smoking history and you're a bit uncertain, you may check their chest. Yeah, and men can get breast cancer too. Yeah. That is true. Okay, well, I think we're five minutes out. So, if there are any other any other questions, then we'll wrap up the ophthalmology live session from Australia and New Zealand. Then. Okay. Thank you all very much. We will sign out and enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Bye-bye.